Heels welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heels is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heels was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm going to talk about why uh, and how we can persuade and educate the wider public about the importance of ageing research. And I'm a writer and editor at the Longevity Reporter, which is a website dedicated to scientific news and supporting ageing research and translating that to the public. And I also work with the British Biogerontology Research Foundation. And so a quick summary, if you don't know about us, we're at a website, and that's uh, Sven and Victor also help with that as well and have written a number of pieces. So the main challenge is this is a survey um, of uh, American adults in 2013 and it showed that 56% of people did not want to live over 120. However, it did show that 68% of people would be fairly interested in most people living above 120. So there is some promising data there. Um, another big point about all this is that scientific literacy is actually very poor across the world. It's, uh, we can start with American scientific literacy, and John Miller at Michigan State University has actually worked on this and has worked out roughly that he thinks that 28% of American adults currently qualify as scientifically literate. This has increased of around 10% from the late 80, uh, 1980s and early 1990s. Um, this score was sort of amalgamated together from whether they could understand the bulk of uh, concepts within a New York Times article. So this was fairly Americanized, but there was also a longitudinal study of American youth, which has followed 5,000 students since 1987, and that showed that 43% of this demographic are scientifically literate. And again, this was uh, according with the ability to read a fairly common science article. So this is a graph. So it has been steadily increasing, but it's still pretty poor, really. Uh, and the rest of the world might possibly be even worse, but this is questionable. So this was also, um, in his research, he also explored this, but he did combine lots of different research studies, which uh, we can kind of question because the original study was very Americanized, and actually it's quite, all these things were based on different studies that had different methods to work out literacy. But basically, we can kind of assume that developed nations, especially Northern Europeans, seem to be slightly better, but the general picture is pretty poor, really. I think it's really important to remember that this, this was literacy on a wider basis as well. It wasn't just biological terms. And considering how complicated aging research is, this is pretty bleak in terms of what most people understand. They, they, they don't know about antagonistic pleiotropy or they don't know about mTOR and those kind of things are way above their head. This was the ability to understand sort of, you know, do plants have DNA and <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so going from this, um, there's been a number of uh, studies uh, by the European Union, which are called Eurobarometer Studies, which is a semi-annual uh, survey of all 27 nations. And it showed that around in 2005 that only 4% of European adults claimed to be very familiar with the stem cell issue. And I think stem cells are a fairly good marker of interest in this sort of thing, like regenerative medicine. Um, other surveys from 2010 and 2013 show that um, almost two thirds of the EU population think the science is making our ways of life changing to change too fast while three quarters think that science and technology could be used for harm effectively. And 52% even think that scientists have a dangerous power because of their knowledge. I think this is quite worrying because it shows there's quite a strong conservative trend, perhaps especially in Europe, despite the fact there is such a huge problem with aging uh, populations. And also, uh, that's what David was talking about earlier, there is a, maybe a slight worry that it could actually kind of backpedal and we could enter a new age where people distrust scientists like, Trump is slightly like that, where it starts to become, there's more of a gap between the science, uh, scientists and the public. And this is um, 
more results from that study, which uh, is effectively in how it's a question of how uh, how well informed you feel about science and where you are. And again, uh, we see that the results are strongest in generally northern European nations, uh, especially like Denmark, Sweden, uh, UK, France, Finland, uh, Belgium's really high as well. Um, so again, this is more research on stem cell opinions. 80% um, of EU citizens in 2010, on, according to one of these same surveys, actually supported embryonic stem research, which is quite good compared to 53% in 2005. So that's quite a large rise. 84% um, supported non-embryonic stem research, uh, cell research, which actually isn't that much of a gap, surprisingly. Um, a similar analysis in 2011 of uh, several polls in the US actually indicated that 62% believe medical research using human embryonic stem cells is acceptable. Um, and a similar study in the UK of 1,700 adults suggested that 57% of UK citizens uh, feel the benefits of stem cell research outweigh any potential risks. So this shows that the majority are kind of interested and agree, but they didn't go into specifics about that. Um, so in terms of where most people actually hear about scientific news, the majority is from uh, TV and print newspapers and websites, but not scientific blogs. So this is generally not coming from more specialist sources. Um, so I think this is a problem because, and I'll go into that why, uh, this was a study conducted by Ipsos Mori in the UK. Um, so media headlines are very sensationalist often, and I think this leads to a lot of disillusionment and disappointment within the industry in general. I think probably everyone else has experienced that. And these are some of the headlines that we've had, like cure death, um, billionaires who want to live forever. There's lots of things that I'm not necessarily against, most people aren't, but I think they're quite different to what a lot of the actual articles or scientists were actually trying to say in what the article was about. Um, so there's actually been a study done on this. A team of French scientists in Paris actually examined the effect of abstract content on new spin as well. Um, and actually 47% were determined to contain some kind of spin, which then fed onto the media after that. So as much as I think it is important to blame the media on this as well, I think there is a little bit of responsibility in some scientists for perhaps extrapolating too much in their abstracts. Or, and this was the study, and it showed that generally people who did um, have some spin in the abstracts, that fed really strongly onto the, um, what impression the media gave of it. So um, this is, <laughs> they often mention Ponce de Leon, the fans of youth, and I'm, I think I'm getting a bit sick of that because it's not always relevant. Um, so I think it's really important to make it human. That was supposed to be <laughs> wider. Um, I think we should be honest. Uh, right now, I don't think we should be promising mortality, although I think it's a great vision. Um, but I think in terms of most people, I think most people do tend to tune off a bit when you say that, because I think they're quite different in terms of the initial steps from what we'd like to achieve. Um, so the, the silver tsunami has been in lots of different talks. I think this was originally a wide, uh, widescreen talk, so it squished some of the text together. But um, I think this is actually particularly appropriate um, and an issue that we can push in trying to translate aging research to the public even more than it has already been done because especially with a world of sluggish economic performance, I think this is a really important motivator for people. People do care about money a lot. If you look at the way that we discuss elections, the economy is always like number one in the things people care about. And I think it could really be a massive engine for growth and a solution to these economic challenges. So if we do try and persuade people along the lines of this is going to hit you in your purse, uh, that's a really, another really important way of translating research. Um, but also it's interesting that uh, there was a questionnaire done in 2013 that asked people whether they'll have an adequate standard of living in old age. And Japan is right down the bottom and it has a pretty dismal confidence. Only 3% of people think they're going to have an adequate standard of living. And actually, although there are some sort of um, splits of the trend, like China's not too bad, uh, but I think that's because they've had recent economic growth, so they're still slightly more confident. But actually, generally, the people who have aging populations, it's pretty poor. Um, people have a fairly poor expectation of their old age in terms of the quality of life. Um, and I think that's something that's quite important to play upon in terms of what we need to do and motivate people. Um, so what can we learn from psychology about this in terms of how we can try to reach people more? Um, I think this is a rather overused quote by Mother Teresa. It just says that if I look at the mass, I will never act. But if I look at one, I will. People are much more motivated by personal issues. They, as much as it's, you know, how many hundred thousand people die a day, I, you can repeat that many times, but people will be like, oh, that's really sad, but then they'll just go ahead and forget about it. So, 
I think there are three main issues that we can learn from is uh, scope insensitivity, base rate fallacy, and confirmation bias. Uh, so base rate fallacy is that people tend to prefer specific information rather than generic or general information. Uh, scope insensitivity is that they tend to prefer personal information over wider statistics that so has to be relevant to them. And confirmation bias is they tend to only trust stuff that either already fits within their worldview or has been repeated by lots of respected sources. And this also, I think this translates to when we look at the actual money race and the deaths, yeah, you can see that the, uh, by far the most money race is raised for breast cancer, which has had very successful public campaigns for charity and awareness as well, and it's touched lots of people's lives. But actually, uh, heart disease hasn't done quite so well in terms of the funding. It's third, but quite a lot lower than breast cancer. And ALS has done fairly well in terms of funding, but actually the death rate's quite low compared to, um, for example, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from this in terms of what motivates people. Um, often uh, charities and donations tend to come from people who have been personally affected by disease. Uh, there's been very good um, lobbying groups for certain rare diseases that have got a lot of things done. And I think that's important to learn from what actually people when people act, and there's often when something happens to them or someone that they love. But actually, if we can try and translate that this is all down to aging pathology, um, that link, I think, still is not clear for enough people. Um, and also, in terms of what we can learn from successful campaigns, uh, as much as it's kind of easy to uh, laugh at things like the No Makeup Selfie and I Still Get Challenged for sort of slacktivism or armchair activism type thing, or people posting, it actually did raise quite a lot of money. I think it was 100 million for ALS Association and 6 million is like six days for Cancer Research UK, which is nothing to sniff at. I, th I think sometimes we're approaching things from a different angle when the public have different priorities and they're approaching this in a different way. Um, I think we need to jot them out of complacency and give them a clear way that could help. We also need to adopt some of these lessons that I think sometimes we don't have to be so cerebral. We can just think about different ways we can attract different kinds of people because I think there's a danger sometimes that you kind of is circular and we all talk amongst ourselves without talking to other people. Um, so this is a common argument, but aging is inevitable. Um, I think this is still not clear enough as much as we've gone about it. I think we have to repeat it. Um, that it's abundant, really clear that aging is connected to virtually all major disease and that this is a really a efficient thing to try and slow it down or at least tackle elements of it. Um, they're intrinsically connected and research has indicated that as well. Um, so living is kind of a side effect of being healthy. I think David Gems touched on that yesterday. People still think that you'll cure all these diseases and somehow you'll die of this pure aging, which is, is rubbish. Um, so, and also this translates in terms of like, people are fairly willing to contribute to specific diseases. So I think there is a lot of will to reduce this type of thing, but they just haven't really um, thought about the fact that you can't really have your cake and eat it, or you can, you can be healthy and live a long time, but they, you know, they, they want to be healthy and not live a long time. And that's, that's kind of counterintuitive. Um, and also the actual research into mechanisms of aging is, is pretty, pretty low, considering that 85% of the deaths in the UK in this case are caused by age-related disease. And this is the similar pattern in the developed world in general, and it's increasing across the world. And in terms of economic burden, as well, I was saying earlier, um, it's quite substantial for each of these diseases, especially dementia because of the care. Uh, but research is only seven pound per person. So I think, uh, trying to be brief on my last point. I think uh, this hasn't maybe been stated as much as I think it should be. I think we are slightly in danger of being insular, and I think um, we could really benefit from a wider inclusion of other nations, um, especially places like China and India, which are starting, maybe starting to suffer from massive demographic issues as well. But this is often sort of a, a Western developed thing, uh, which I don't think it should be. Uh, and this is indicated by the fact that R&D spending in China has increased by 40 times over from 1995. Uh, it's now totaling 150 billion, which is just 2% of their uh, GDP. And the UK government's spending on R&D is only 0 0.5. I must say that like, this is actually quite bad. In Germany, I think, is somewhere in it three. So the UK actually performs quite badly on that. Um, but I think that the growth shows that as much as there are problems with China as well, like um, Dimitri was saying that 80% of clinical trials may have been forged to some extent or incorrect. I think the willpower in other areas of the world that are starting to be more interested and perhaps have a slightly different opinion or slant on this is, is actually really growing. 
Um, and I think they really need to be part of the conversation to push this as a global thing. I think if we can get this moving more in one area of the world, then there'll be more, much more motivation for Western governments in particular to be like, we can't, you can't, we can't lag behind. If they're doing this, we have to do this as well. Um, so as a kind of end point, I'm just, I think to me, the message should be simple, bold, honest, hopeful, relatable. <laughs> And we should just repeat, repeat, repeat patiently. Uh, it's very frustrating to have to say the same arguments to people all the time. But I think we just have to kind of stick it out and be patient with them. That's, some of them are scared. And they just, I think it's easy to forget that the gap is, is so large now uh, between the science, uh, science and the public that they just don't have time to, to research all these things and look these things up. And you just have to spend some time with them, um, not be too aggressive, and listen to their concerns. And I think. You know, sometimes you won't win them all over, but I think there will be a gradual shift. I've certainly noticed that from people I've talked to. They're kind of interested, but they're not quite there yet. I think if we just carry on going, I think we can speed that up. Um, this is just a, a tagline from a video that I think is really good and educational um, by the AFAR and British Society, uh, British Society for Research on Aging and the Glenn Foundation. Just saying things like, a better world for older people is a better world for everyone. I think we need more campaigns with kind of simple messages like that. Um, so thank you for listening.